Very well. So, uh, as I promised, today we will do the solvable case, and our lab mouse will be the affine group. So I remind you, the affine group over by the affine group over a field K, I just mean the group consisting of these matrices. Oh. Very well. Well, you know, you can see this as this, the group of points in an algebraic group. But Very well. So this has two interesting subgroups. There is the unipotent subgroup here. So it's the matrices with one in the, the diagonal. And then there's the torus. Well, there are several tori, but the nicest one is this one. Yes, you might wonder why it's called a torus. Let's not go into that. Um, so this is, of course, a solvable group. The torus is abelian. The unipotent group is, well, nilpotent. Um, in this case, it also happens to be abelian. Now, very well. All right. Uh, I said last time that there is a, a very close relationship between this and K considered as a field that is both under multiplication and addition. So, <coughs> excuse me. So when you have the unipotent group, and you consider the just the group law on that, you have that the product of these two elements is, of course, given by addition. Whereas if you consider the action, so U acts on itself, but T also acts on U by conjugation, so you have This is one array, zero one. Very well. So, um, studying the group in the affine group is the same in the end as studying rows in the field K under addition and multiplication. Um, but let us not start assuming that we already have elements in U and T. Let us start with a fully general set A and try to get elements in U and T. So, lemma. So let G be a fine group over K. And so U is just above. And you have the projection map here. And I'm going to work with a subset A of G. And as usual, I put on all the inverses of the elements of A also in A. And um, we assume that A is not containing U, otherwise it's really, really boring. And um, very well. And we let X be an element of A not in U. So T here is a special I given any element. So this T is the centralizer of a given G, any G that is diagonal. But in general, I can go the other way around. Given a G, I can define T to be C of G. And I can write T in this way as a group of diagonal elements just by changing variables. So it's nicer to work with an arbitrary element X and consider C of X. Though I could just skip that step and work with this particular T. Very well. So what is, the, what, is what we want to prove? We want to prove that a squared has a large intersection with the unipotence. How large? A divided by the projection of A. So the projection of A is basically the set of uh, things that we get in the upper right corner. The upper right, this, it, pi of A is the set of upper right corner, upper left corners of A. Um, so I claim that A squared intersection U is A 
So at least A divided by the number of upper right corners. It makes sense. Um, and on the other hand, I have that the intersection with T is at least, well, it's at least roughly the number of upper right corners. No? This quotient here, if A does not grow rapidly, then the quotient is close to 1. So here, of course, T is C of X. But uh, as I said, you could just forget about X and start with this particular T. Um, all right. So this will be just an, an application of the orbit stabilizer lemma that we saw last time. Right, so uh, by orbit stabilizer, in fact, by the corollary to orbit stabilizer that we saw last time, we have already done this, you have that A square, so th this we have really already done. This is just, you see, this is just a special case that we saw last time. We really should do only the second, the second one. Uh, so remember, this was orbit stabilizer applied to the action of G on its quotient. So in this case, pi of A is the size of the orbit, and this one, U is a stabilizer. Very well. Um, now, consider the action of G on itself by conjugation. Then again by orbit stabilizer, you have that A squared intersection, the stabilizer, is at least A, where this is the orbit under conjugation. Now, consider, um, so we consider A T, Well, no, this is just A squared. It's the same thing. Um, this is in T, so this is what we're bounding from below. Um, now, what are we going to do? AX, the size of sets does not change when I displace them. And this is contained in what? This is a, this is something, this is a bracket. This is something of the form little a x inverse of little a, x inverse. So this is in u, and it's also in a4. So this contains a4 intersection u. No? Because all the commutators of g lie in u. So, again, trivially, ax is at most a4 u. But we also had, again, by orbit stabilizer for the third time, we have that A5, which is, of course, A4 times A. This is at least A4 intersection U times pi of A. So we just put this together, and we get that, you know, AT is at least, well, as we knew, this was, yes, so AX, this is contained in A4 intersection U, so you have A4 intersection U. This at least then a to the fifth. Now a here divided by a to the fifth pi i, and that's it. Not very hard, but it's it's good to do it, you know, with your bare hands just to get a good feel for what's going on here. It's a good example of these lemmas about growth in subgroups and growth in quotients. But the point is that just by taking quotients and doing what is really just pigeonhole, you get many elements in the unipotent subgroup and many elements in the torus. And what's good to, to realize here is if you, if you take the product of these two, you get almost A. This times that is A times the quotient A divided by A to the 5. So we've got all of the meat, so to speak. No, it's like... Well, you put the bones on one side, the flesh on the other, and if you put them back together, you get something almost as big as the A which you started with. That's a good thing. Now, 
Now we really get to the important part. Uh, be, I say the important part because it is here that we will see the inductive process that we will see yet again when we study SL2. And as I said, you don't need an ordering to do induction. That should be one of the morals of this proof. So, prop, so let G be affine group, the affine group over FP, say, this will simplify matters. So U is the maximal unipotent subgroup, just as before. And say that AU is in U, AT is in T. Of course, if somebody gives us um, a set A to start with, then you isolate AU and AT using this lemma here. Uh, and then what do you do? Well, assume as usual that uh, AU is in U. Um, no, sorry. Assume as usual that AU equals AU inverse, that AT contains the identity, that AU also contains the identity, and that AU is not just the identity. Then I claim that A2 squared, you let it act on AU, and then you multiply it by itself six times, I claim that this is much larger than either A2 or A1, A, AU. It's going to be the product, at least the product of AU and AT, or, or P. I mean, you cannot be bigger than P, so there has to be a condition of that form, right? No. Is this clear? So by this, I just mean, so A2 squared AU means T1U, where this means acting by conjugation. All right. But you can, in particular, it's a product. Um, very well. So I will call U, I will call A a pivot. if the function phi a defined by, well, what you would expect, just by the action. So this takes u, t, to the product of u and t, a, where, again, this is u, t, a, t inverse. So you call a a pivot if this function is injective. No, a, a pivot, it's like a, it's like a fulcrum. It's something you use in order to, well, get around. Um, and how is a pivot useful? So first of all, suppose the easy case, case A, is when you have a pivot A already in your set AU. In that case, you're done very quickly. How? Well, as I said, if you have an injective map, then it's... Well, as cavemen knew, um, the image of an injective map is as big as its domain. So you have that phi applied to AU and AT. Well, the image of this pair is AU times AT. So big. Uh, and, but what, what is this? Um, well, this is contained of course you have that phi a is contained in um, uh, a u a T of A. Very well. Um, so you are done, right? Yeah, this is a tiny subset of this. It's a, remember, is in U. So you're going to have the DC in A U, A T, A U.
to the six. Well, to the two wouldn't do, but to the six. Very well. So th that's very easy. You get growth by injectivity, and uh, by the injectivity given by a pivot. Now, pivots are wonderful things, but it may be very well that you don't have a pivot in AU. It may even be that there is no pivot in U altogether. So what happens if there is no pivot in U? Um, it's actually quite easy to see that it can happen only if a T times a U is really large. Now, uh, so say, u1, t1, and u2, t2 collide if their images under phi a are the same. Now, saying that there are no pivots in u means that there is at least one collision for every single a. And then what happens? So, um, there are no pivots, but you can choose the most pivot-like. What do I mean by the most pivot-like? It's the so th there's always there's going to be a collision for every a, but I choose the a with the least collisions. Or an a, there could be a tie, such that this is minimal. So number of u1, u2. A U, so number of pairs such that the things collide under phi A. We want this to be minimal, K A. Um, now, it's quite easy, quite easy to see. that two distinct pairs can collide for at most one A. That you prove with your bare hands. No, it's why? Well, you do it, but it's really a solution it's the fact that there is only one solution to a, to a linear equation in one variable. Um, and then, what can we say then? Um, well, then the number of collisions, the, the total then uh, for u eka is at most um, au at P minus one plus a u squared a t squared, right? Um, here, no. This is when I'm I'm actually including epsilon e as well. So this term comes from the value of a equals the identity, and for all the a's that are not the identity, so for each of those p minus one possible values of a. I have at most a u a t uh, contributions to k a. Uh, I'm not sure I like how I just stated things. No, I would like to state it the other way around. Sorry. So for um, the contribution of the pairs which are identical is a u times a t. Um, that uh, uh, well, those contribute p minus one, so I do. I am excluding these. I should not have corrected myself. And then, for all the other distinct pairs, the distinct pairs of pairs, so it's in fact less than a u a t squared of them. You have at mo you have a collision for at most one a. Very well. At the same time, you have what? You have by Cauchy Schwartz. And as usual, it should just be called Cauchy. Schwartz just had something to do with integrals, but never mind that. So by Cauchy Schwartz, you have that phi of A, A U A T, this is at least A U squared, A T squared, 
divided by Ka. Um, and so you have phi A. Um, yep, we could go directly here. Um, and so since Ka is at most, Ka, remember, is a minimal one. Ka is the, the best Ka. So you just have to divide this by P minus 1. And you get this at most AUAT plus AU squared AT squared. So you just put these things together, and we have, well, phi A AUAT, it's at least, well, you just, you know, plug this in here and you get actually a harmonic mean, you get AUAT plus 1P. And of course the harmonic mean is um, at least the minimum of the two divided by two. So, very well. Uh, all right, so we have the lower bound we wanted, but are, are we quite done? No, because here um, we were choosing an A, but A might not be in A, in big A. Now, we are saying there is a little A which makes these things grow, but you might think, well, you know, if I had something wonderful, I could do a lot of things, but this A is out in the universe, in you. It's not in my set A. Aha. Uh -huh. However, the fact that A, little a itself, is not a pivot helps us. Because the fact that, the very fact that A is not a pivot makes it reachable. In what sense? Little a is out of our reach, or out of our direct reach, but we do have, we know that phi A, U1, T1, equals phi A, U2, T2 for some things that are reachable, some things that are immediately within our grasp. These things are in AU and AT. But then what are we going to do? Well, note first of all that um, these are distinct, right? It's quite easy to show that because of this very inequality, you're going to have, in fact, that T1 is different from T2. Um, and so, because T1 is different from T2, we can define a map from U to itself as follows. So, so psi T1, T2 from U to itself given by, well, u gets mapped to t1 of u, t2 of u, inverse, this is injective. Um, let me actually, you know, commit a heresy and write the matrices down. This is just going to be 1, t1 minus t2, a. Yeah, so now it's completely clear that it's injective. Right? Because t1 is distinct from t2, this is injective. Um, now, very well, as I was saying, um, think of this. Think of phi A as being some line, an extremely useful line, whose slope is not given to us, or it's not within our scope, but we are being given two points, so to speak, on the line, and those two points, which we do have in our grasp, define the line. Um, and the following is just high school algebra, basically. And we will be using, the one thing to keep in mind here is that we will be using the commutativity of T here. So, for, um, well, U, T, we have, 
we are going to use psi t1, t2 to unfold something. So you have this beautiful thing, phi a u2. We love phi a of ut because it make, phi a makes things bigger. And the, other, the point is that with this map psi, I'm going to remove a, so to speak, or I'm going to make a into something we do have within our language, something that is a product of u, t, and so on. U1, T1, and so on. So this is what, by definition of psi, is T1, UTA, and here inverse T2, UTA. And, well, you manipulate things a little bit, and you get that this is, um, just by because T is abelian, you have that this is T1, U, T, psi, T1, T2, A, and here's the beautiful thing. Precisely because you had this equality, you're going to have that this is equal to, what is this equal to, or rather, what is psi T1, T2 of A? That is just going to be U inverse, U1 inverse U2. This is that. That's a good thing. So A has disappeared, that's what we wanted. So Psi T1, T2, Psi A, UT, or rather here I'm going to put A, U, A, U, A, T. Um, well, this is going to be less than or equal because this is contained in what? This is going to be contained in A, T, A, U, that just comes from T1 of U times a t a u squared a t a u inverse, but that's the same as, I mean, I'm assuming that these things are their own inverses, so that's all fine. And this is, of course, contained in a t a u to the fourth. So all is well there. At the same time, remember, phi t1 t2, that map was injective. So this is just going to be equal to phi a, a1, a t. But that's what we wanted, because we have shown that phi a, a1, a t is big, and we wanted to, sh we wanted to show that this was big. No? So we have immediately that a t, a u, 4. So this may have seen as a slightly long manipulation, um, well, manipulations are easy to do, hard to explain. There's nothing, th th let me tell you what the basic ideas here are. So I repeat, there's a step of unfolding that's technically important, but um, really, really what is at stake here is that if you assume that there are no pivots, that means every, every element is at least a little bit bad, and the very fact that it's bad for some elements in our sets makes it, makes it reachable by means of our sets. All right, um, and now we go on to case C. Case C is the case where, well, there are no pivots in our set A, but uh, there are pivots out there. So in particular, there are pivots and non-pivots in the world in U. Now, what are we going to do with that? That may not seem like much. You know, there are good and bad people in the world, but um, this can actually be used as follows. And remember, there are two ideas here. In case A, we saw the power of injectivity. In case B, besides seeing that, we saw how being bad was a good thing in the sense, being bad in the sense of not giving you injectivity, in the sense that being bad makes you reachable. So what are we going to do? So case C is when there exists pivots and non-pivots in U. So this is the inductive step. So here it will look as if there's still an ordering. There sort of is in Z mod PZ plus one. But really, we don't use the fact that it's an ordering. We are just using the fact that one generates Z mod PZ. And as we will see later, it's generation, not the ordering that is important. So 
Um, since, and this is how being in FP makes things simpler, since AU is not just, you know, it's not empty and it's not the identity, AU generates U, that's why it's special to FP, but never mind that. Uh, so there exists A, not a pivot, um, G in AU, and GA, a pivot. No? So when you have that there are good and bad people in the world, and you have a set of generators, there must be a good person and a bad person, such that their quotient is in the set of generators. Simple as that. And now what are, what are we going to do? Um, so we have that because GA is a pivot, so phi AG, phi GA, excuse me, this is injective. Very well. Uh, and now we are going, again, A is unknown, uh, or GA is, in, is unknown in itself, but we n at least know that A is not a pivot, so A will be able to apply an unfolding procedure so as to get our hands onto A. So we have psi T1, T2, phi GA, UT, this will be what? By definition, this is T1 of UT, G, T, A. And here we have the same thing, only well, we take the inverse, and here we have T2 instead of T1, U, T, J, T, A. Again, using the, um, using the fact that the torus is abelian, we have T1, U, T, J, T, G, here we have, well, we have T1 of TA divided by T2 of TA, but we put T on the outside and we get T of T1A um, uh, yes, T2A inverse. And this, we remember, this is nothing other than um, U1 inverse, U2 inverse. Where, excuse me, where are, what are T1 and U1 and T2 and U2? Nobody asked me. Well, they are two pairs that make A not a pivot, right? Just as before. And the very fact that they collide, that they get sent to the same thing, is what accounts for this equality. It's what accounts for the fact that, um, that T1A times T2A inverse equals U1 inverse times U2. It's the same thing as saying this. Very well. Um, but just as before, Psi T1, T2 is injective. Because T1 is distinct from T2. So it doesn't change the size of things. So we obtain then that, um, yep, this expression here, which for T and U varying in AT and AU is contained in what? It's contained in well, AT, um, AU, um, a t squared a u. I'm getting t g out of it. A t a u squared. That's the middle term. A t squared a u. That's that term over here. And here you have uh, a t a u. Well, that's just a set of all things of this form. That will be at least. Um, Psi T1, T2, Phi GA, uh, AUAT, and 
since psi doesn't change the size of things, and um, psi g, phi g a is injective as well, you have that this is just the size of a u times a t, that is, a u times a t. So we conclude uh, no, we have got well this is a sub, this long thing is just a subset of a t squared a u to the six this is at least a t times a u. And so we're done. Now, so let me emphasize, going backwards, what the main points are. So first of all, you can do injection, you can do induction as soon as you have generation. And um, this induction allows you to say, well, if you still want to think in terms of ordering, there was one last bad guy. There were, may not have been no. There may have been no good guys in your original set. If there were, you would be in case A. But there was one last bad guy, and then there was a good guy. A good guy solves your problem. A bad guy uh, is reachable. So in just one step, that one step from the bad guys to the good guys solves your problem. It's just one step. It costs you one unit, and you are done. Um, all right. Now, what do we do with that? Well, we just put this together with the lemma we had before. And so, uh, well, corollary. Let G be a, the affine group over FP. U is the max maximal unipotent. Pi is the quotient map. A is in G. A is a inverse. A contains identity, so and you assume that A is not containing any maximal torus. Uh, where maximal torus is a centralizer of is a centralizer of an X not in U. Then either Uh, a to the 57, just to give a complete figure, but it's actually what you get from the proof, is at least 1, 2, square root of P, P A times A, or A to the 57 is like this. And in this case, you also have that the unipotent group is contained in A to the 112. Um, so just to give you a picture, so what does this mean? Uh, it's really the torus, so that this, it's the things, the R in the upper left corner that's making things grow. So either it's making things grow by a lot, as in by a factor that is a square of, the square root of the number of upper left corners, or you have already, in a few steps, you fill out the entire unipotent group, and then you cannot grow much more, or you can grow only, you, your size is, the size of the entire unipotent group by the number of upper left corners. Now, that there's, you see the set of upper left corners could grow quite slowly because that's just a subset of an abelian group and nothing acts on it other than itself. So it would be governed by Freeman Rouge, really, and nothing else. But as long as you have the maximal torus acting the unipotent subgroup and you haven't filled out the unipotent subgroup yet, you will get fast growth. Um, so, well, I can just leave the proof as a very simple exercise, but, um, you know, the, use the lemma and then the prop. A U, A T, with A U, A T, greater than A, A to the 5, A, uh, and then use proof and use the proposition. Very well, yes? Uh, mm. um, am I missing something here? Where? Yeah. 
Yes, so, wait a second. So, exactly. So, what you're going to get, just let me more, be more explicit then. So, the proposition is going to give you how much rows there is in the unipotent group. So, it's going to give you a lower bound for the intersection here. That's what the proposition gives you, right? But then, what can you do with that? Um, well, you plug that in here, but then what, what can you do with that? That's how many elements you have in the unipotent subgroup. But then you can you just get a, a set of coset representatives in A. That is, you just for every upper left corner that you get from uh, the, uh, that appears in elements of A, you pick one element of A, and you multiply them by all of these elements in the unipotent subgroup. So that's of course again something that we included in the orbit stabilizer theorem. But it's the easy half. <coughs> yes. And by the way, if you found out that um, Yes, if this quotient were small, then you would get growth anyhow, automatically. That's what it would mean for the quotient to be small. So if this quotient is smaller than 1 over square root of pi of a, you have this immediately, anyhow, with 5 instead of 57. So you might as well assume that it is not too small, and you get the result. So now let me talk just a bit as to what do you have in the general case. So, what does this really mean, in summary? So, this is giving you growth, or you could turn it on its head and say it's classifying sets that grow slowly. If A grows slowly, meaning A to the K less than A to the 1 plus delta, where k is 57 and delta is a small constant. It's not too small, really. Uh, then one of these cases must hold. Either A is contained in a subgroup for some t, some maximal torus t. Max a maximal torus is just the um, the centralizer of an element not in U. It can be made diagonal by a change of variables. Or A is almost contained in U, meaning that we have very few upper left corners. So you might actually be in, the, in U or a coset of U. So it, you're containing very few cosets, that's what it means. It's less than a to the delta. Or AK contains a subgroup of G, it contains U. Uh, and notice here that why it's, what's so special about containing U? Note um, that the group generated by A, which is a subgroup of G, Quotiented by U is nil potent. Well, in fact, a billion in this case. Now, why have I written these things in this way? Uh, it's because, in general, uh, for solvable subgroups, you have this sort of classification. In fact, well, um, this is actually fully there in the literature only for k equals to fp. Well, you can also do it for k equals the reals or the complex numbers. But this, uh, this is a gap in the literature. We don't have a full proof for k um, semi-open. Well, let me say open um, for K equals FQ. Uh, it's not severely open, but I think the, pro the existing proof has to be made much more elegant, and then FQ will just plop out of it. 
So there are things to be done. But, um, and in that case, and this is a general feature of reality, delta does depend on n. So, so by a solo linear group, I just mean something in SLN. And so note, delta will depend on the dimension, on the rank. It actually depends on n. There are examples to show this. Um, so this is a special case of what Briar, Green, and Tao call the helfgott lindenstrauss conjecture, which is proven in some in some cases. It's, uh, uh, it's it's not too far away from being complete. But I like really a quantitative statement like this that tells you not just that there is a, there are some constants with some dependencies, but that you have good dependencies. Um, and it, well, in general, you would have O of delta here instead of just delta, but you know you have a polynomial dependency. Um, and here, in order to get a good feel for things, uh, it would be very, a very good thing if each of you could just um, mm, do what. Unfortunately, in the notice called proposition 14. It should be called exercise 14. So. Uh, just sit down and give examples of sets, toy with examples of sets that fail to grow because they are in each of those cases. Now, I said that there was a close relation, and I explained what it was, with growth in the field. Um, let me make that completely explicit. So, core of prop. Let x be in FP. And this is the main part. And this is older than all of this. I would create several people. Uh, Burgan on the one hand, Katz, Tao, Konyakin. Well, I think the, the Burgan and Katzau should be on one side. Well, it's a bit complicated, but all of these people were involved. Um, with x minus x. Then you have that 6y squared x, meaning this added to itself six times, is at least 1 half min x, y, p. Now, that is, you have x and y elements of the field, you multiply them, you sum them, and you get something bigger than x or y. You get something at least as big as a product, unless you're already hitting all of fp. Well, this is a very easy corollary. It just goes as follows. You write the elements of x like this, and the elements of y like this, and you're done. And you just apply the proposition. Ta-da. Not very hard. It's, it's just, this, this is older than the formulation I have given you. And uh, the proof that I have given you is inspired, actually, of the, uh, in the original proof, the, one of the proofs that was given of this. The idea of pivoting is already implicit in there, and the idea of induction in this sense. And from this corollary, you can deduce the corollary of the corollary, but uh, it uses another idea, the katz tau lemma, well, it's a page. You get that. Um, so it's, it's this really has for the applications of the sum product theorem. For most of them, this would be enough. So the following is just a really nice restatement of this restatement of the proposition. Um, it's that the sum product theorem is that if you have a a subset of F P star larger than a constant, smaller than the entire thing. Then either A times A is much larger than A, or A plus A is much larger than A. And so in fact, it's less general than this corollary, because it forces X and Y to be more or less the same thing. But there it is. But it's, it's a very nice statement. These are two constants. Well, they, they depend on only on epsilon. All right. So, in fact, when I first gave a proof of growth in SL2, I used this theorem, 
But then in later proofs, well, already when I was doing things over SL3, but much more so when other people generalized it, uh, what was used was really the idea of pivoting, which we have seen in the proof. And, well, that's it for today. Aren't you happy? <laughs> Okay, any questions, guys? No questions? Okay, then let's thank Harold again. And let me remind you, the schedule says we start at 2.20.